You're listening to the Lifehouse Fellowship Podcast. Wherever you're listening today, we pray that this message is encouraging, it's empowering, and it equips you to change your world. Amen. John chapter 5, we're going to be reading a few verses this morning. Now, I've requested the New King James Version for a reason, and I'll explain that in just a moment. Let's read through this passage. We'll be starting in verse 1 and going through verse 15. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool which is called in Hebrew Bethsaida, having five porches. Someone underline that or circle that or write it down. Verse 3, in these lay, someone write, write this down or circle it. The word lay here means that they were actually laying on top of each other. It was packed tightly, almost as if they were like sardines packed in. So have a picture of people, laying people, broken people, laying on top of each other, packed in around this pool under these porches. There was a great multitude. Great multitude here is the word, the same word that is used in the feeding of the 5,000, where there was a great multitude of people or individuals most believe it was 5,000 men, so there were children and women with, or their wives or their spouses with them. So there were many people. So now I'm not throwing out a number of how many people were at this pool, but there was a lot of people that were stacked on top of each other. A great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. Now, here's where it's gonna differ in, for some of you in your Bible. And I'll explain it in a moment. Verse 4, for you just pause until we get to verse 5. An angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Verse 5, now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered, sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well. He took up his bed and he walked. And that day was the Sabbath, verse 10. The Jews therefore said to him, who was cured? It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. And he answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, who is this man who said, uh, who said you take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was that's going to be important later for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place and afterwards Jesus found him in the temple and said to him see you have been made well sin no more lest the worst thing come upon you verse 15 the man departed and he told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well and for this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing that they were going to kill him because he healed someone on the Sabbath? <laughs> this just shows you how messed up religion can get. When we start putting some man-made restrictions on God's laws, how messed up it can get and how legalistic it can be. Now I want you just to think about this story for a moment. This all happened at Bethsaida. The Aramaic word Bethsaida means house of mercy or house of grace in the English. So this, ex this is exemplifying the church here. House of mercy. Someone say house of mercy. If there is any place on earth, any people who should embody mercy and grace, it is the church. Amen? 
Having received mercy ourselves, we should find it natural to extend mercy to others. But sadly, the church is often a place of judgment and criticism. Amen. And Jesus calls it to be a place of mercy. And this morning as I teach, I want this message not only to be an encouragement to you as an individual, but collectively as a church, because I believe it helps us to see how we should do ministry, Good work. how we should operate in ministry. Amen. This is a picture of how the church should be operating. Good work. The Pool of Bethsaida is situated in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate, close to the Temple Mount. Archaeological uh, excavations have identified it as a complex of two large pools known as the Northern and the Southern Pools, which were part of a larger system used for water collection and purification. The pools were surrounded by five porticos, or colonnades, or porches, however you want to say it, which provided shelter for the sick and the disabled who gathered there. Now, originally, the pools were likely built to serve as reservoirs to collect rainwater for the city's water supply. But over time, the site developed a reputation for its healing properties. The belief was that an angel, or the legend, is that an angel would periodically stir the waters and the first person to enter the pool after this event would be healed of any affliction. And this tradition or this legend made the pool of Bethsaida a place of hope and anticipation for those seeking physical healing. Now these pools were also known as mikvahs. It was a ritual cleaning bath, a place where the Jews would go before they go to the Temple Mount. It was a cleansing place. So these waters, now there's some discrepancies and there's some, you know, some butting of heads on the validity of the pool of Bethsaida. But it was a play, it was a mikvah that uh, would be used for ritual cleaning. Now, how the water stirred, based on the legend, some say that it was an angel, but there's nothing to fully back that it was an angel showing up. There are some things that say because it was a lower pool. How many of y'all like a little history here? Yeah. I thought this was interesting. Some say because it was a lower pool, there was a gate that led from the upper, uh, upper pool, the northern pool, to that one that would be open, and that fresh water, the spring water, would come in, and it would create this bubbling effect in the southern pool. Okay? So there would naturally be some bubbling up, maybe a whirlpool because of that being opened up. And there could have been some superstition, which is some of what they say. There are some that say that this could have even been a pagan place at some point. Now, take all of what I just said and put it, you know, kind of over here to the side. Don't let that hinder what I'm going to share with you this morning. But I want you to be aware of that even if it was an angel, if God chose to use an angel or there was a natural spring that had minerals, something was happening at this pool. Because there were people that showed up. There were sick people, lame people. So there was something stirring in the water. Does that make sense? All right. The site was extensively ex uh, excavated in the late 19th and 20th centuries. I want you to know, before this, the uh, theologians thought that John was just making this up. It was just one of his stories. He, was just, he just made this whole story up. And so up until this point, when they, the archaeologists excavated this site, and I can't remember what era it was, but they had covered up over that pool and built upon it. So fast forward centuries later, they excavated it, and archaeologists discovered remnants of the pool, including the five porticos that were talked about or mentioned in the Gospel of John. And the findings confirm the biblical description lending historical credibility to the scriptural account. Amen. Now, isn't it cool when, when science <laughs> backs 
and, and says, oh, the Bible got it right. Yeah. So John wasn't just making up a story here. Something was happening in that water and something was stirring. The pool of Bethsaida was the focus of a local legend about healing. But Jesus showed that faith in legends and superstition is misplaced. In contrast, faith in Jesus Christ, the one who can heal with a simple word, the Savior who can forgive any sin, the true master of the house of mercy, is never misplaced. Jesus is the living water. And I believe that this story was told so that you and I would see a picture of a water's being turned. And we might think, well, God's moving in that. And it's very well possible God was moving in that periodically. And something was happening and people had hoped to believe that, that if they could just get to the water, they would be healed. But Jesus wants us to see that he is the only way. Amen? My first point this morning is Jesus knows your condition. Just as Jesus knew the condition of the man at the pool of Bethsaida, he knows the intimate details of our life. He's aware of your struggles. He's aware of your pain. He's aware of your needs. And it goes beyond superficial understanding. He sees the true state of our hearts and lives and he's providing the compassion and the care that you and I need. My second point this morning is Jesus sees you and he chose you. Now all this is pulled from the scripture because as I was thinking about it, Jesus walks into this place. There are potentially hundreds of people stacked on top of each other. And Jesus goes to the one. He sees them. Do you know that no matter where you are today, no matter what situation that you're in today, Jesus sees you. Jesus knows you. He understands. He has compassion and mercy for you. One of my favorite scenes in Avatar, the Waterworld one, I'm not recommending it. I'm just saying there's a scene where they, they grab each other's arm like this, and they look in each other's eyes and they say this language, I don't know, but basically it means I see you. And their eyes lock and it's, it's this, can, do you know when you shake someone's hand and they don't look at you and you're like, why aren't you looking at me? <laughs> yeah. But I love this picture because Jesus locks eyes with us and he looks down. In fact, this is a tool that they tell you in, in speaking lessons, it's just, you need to lock eyes with people. You need to connect with them, right? If I looked over your heads all the time, y'all would be able to tell, oh, he's not even looking at us. It looks like I'm looking at you, but I'm really not. I'm looking up. But if I actually lock eyes with you, there's something about that that says, I see you. Better yet, Jesus sees you. And he knows what's going on. And when someone's hurting, someone is struggling to have someone who will look them in the eye and say, I see you, means a lot, and it speaks a lot. And that in itself is a picture of what we see here. Jesus sees this man, and he chose him. He didn't just know his condition. He actively seeks us out. Jesus remind us, reminds us in John 15, 16, you did not choose me but I chose you. And this emphasizes his intentional selection and love for us. Moreover, he is El Roy, which means the God who sees me. Isn't that awesome? And just as he saw Hagar in her distress, he sees us in our moments of need and acts out of his great love and mercy his vision is not passive. It is accompanied by his, uh, his purposeful choice to intervene and offer healing and salvation. I love this about Jesus. It's not about, I'm just going to heal you, but I, wa I want to heal the whole person. Someone say the whole person. <laughs> All right. 
Now, this is one year into Jesus' ministry, and he goes to this pool, and he sees this man, and he knows he's been in that condition for a long time, and he says the question to me that seems unnecessary, but, but Jesus would never say or do anything that was unnecessary. Amen? And I want us to think about this question. Because here's what he said. Do you want to be made well? Good. Do you want to be made well? Y'all, I'm, last week, actually the last couple weeks have been, uh, I've, I'm not even going to say it, but I've had a lot of pain in my body. And uh, I've been uh, taking ibuprofen just to help with the pain, but like for some reason the last two weeks have just been worse which probably is spiritual warfare because the lord knew what i was going to be talking about and the enemy knew that and he was he's trying to do everything he can to pull me off track okay it's not about me but i want you to know that that uh where was i i should i see i got sidetracked it's not about me do you want to be me i had to ask myself the question <laughs> i'm walking with abigail and we've been trying to do better uh, and, you know, get on this health routine and regimen. And so we're out walking, but I'm listening about the pool of Bethsaida. I'm, I'm listening about the, uh, the scripture and I'm just kind of listening to it. And it gets to the part where he asked the question, do you want to be made well? And I start crying and I'm having to walk faster so Abigail doesn't see me crying. But I'm, like, <laughs> I'm trying to hold it together. But I was like, there's so much in that. Do you want to be made well? I was, I was asking my, myself that question. I've had a lot of pain in my body. There's some stuff going on, blah, blah, blah. But I, the bottom line is, do I want to be made well? Now, how many of you know what the, the natural answer would be is, yeah. yes, I want to be made well. But I'm going to share with you this morning that sometimes that's not the case. And I'm not completely healed right now, but I am standing on his promises that I will be healed. And I am declaring every day as I walk this out and trust him for my healing to happen. Now, I can honestly say I didn't take any pain pills this morning and I'm not feeling any pain. Hallelujah. Okay. So, um, do you want to be made well? Let me ask you this question this morning. Do you want to be made well? Amen. Now, just pause a moment. Your, your first response is yes. But what you're going to see for this man that was at the pool of Bethsaida, that was not his first response. Good. Good. <laughs> you know, the crazy thing is that this man didn't even say yes. <laughs> you would think in his condition, after 38 years, someone asked him, do you want to be made well? The first words out of his mouth should have been, yes. If you really wanted to be made well, I don't care if it was 40 years. If you really wanted to be made well and a man shows up who you don't know and asks you that question, I'd be like, yes, I want to be made well. But that wasn't his first response. So this morning, I want to share a few thoughts of why I think sometimes we don't say yes to the question, do you want to be made well? But before I do that, I want, us, I want to take a moment to help us understand the nature of God and, and understand that there are times that maybe our healing or our breakthrough doesn't quite look like we think it should look like. Or maybe we don't even understand why we don't, haven't been healed or we haven't been set free or there hasn't been breakthrough and we just don't understand. And it's okay. Because I believe as you draw near to God, as you study scripture, as you spend time with him, he brings revelation to you. Number three, God's reality is greater than my limited frame of reference. In other words, don't put God in a box. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, 
Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's reality is greater than my limited frame of reference. This means that the true nature and existence of God surpasses what an individual can perceive, understand, or imagine. It suggests that human comprehension is inherently limited and cannot fully grasp the entirety of God's being or actions. So this brings me to my first thought this morning of why we don't say yes, and it's the issues of excuses. You know, we often come up with excuses of why God's power and who God is, why his work won't apply to us. But much like the, main, uh, the lame man who said, Sir, I have no man to put me in the water when the angels come. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. A situation is desperate. Nobody's here to help me. You see, he believed that his healing was dependent upon specific conditions being met. Yet Jesus, transcending these limitations, simply commanded, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And this demonstration that God's power is not confined or perceived obstacles or limitations. So let us not limit God. He didn't say be healed. He said, rise, take up your bed, and walk. Trust that his power and plans exceed our excuses and doubts. Just as Jesus healed the lame man despite his perceived barriers, God can work beyond our expectations and our excuses. You see, excuses are, are an attempt to justify where we are. Do you realize that what the man was saying is, it's not my fault that I'm not healed, it's someone else's fault. Think about this. Potentially, the number one excuse in our society for our problems is blaming somebody else. Whew, isn't it easy just to blame somebody? Well, so-and-so did that. That's what caused me to be where I am today. Good. Well, my dad acted like an idiot, so I'm, I'm going to act like an idiot. Now, look, there are some family things that you need to break off of you. I'm not saying that, okay? Hear me. But a lot of times we get stuck in that place. And instead of unpacking it and dealing with it, it becomes an excuse for us of why we can't find breakthrough or, more, or move forward. So when I'm talking about healing this morning, I'm talking about the whole person, right? For this guy, it was physical, but there may be other areas in our life that need healing, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. All right. Uh, so this is actually the top lie of the enemy convincing us that our situation is someone else's fault by shifting blame we fail to see the truth and the potential for God's work in our lives can I tell you something no one can hinder no one can hinder the destiny on your life but you no one can hinder the destiny on your life but you it doesn't matter what anyone, anyone's done to you. And here's what people tell me all the time. Well, Matt, you don't understand my situation. You're right. I don't understand your situation. And, and I'm not saying that you don't deal with the stuff that needs to be dealt with. There are times, there are, there are things that happen to us that we may need to get counseling or we may need to walk it out. There may be a process to the healing. We may need somebody to help us walk that out to help us see it another way, right? Because we may get locked into our filters of past wounds or hurts, and, and so we may filter everything through that brokenness. So I want you to hear me, it's not a one way and that's it. But excuses are something that can get in the way of us being able to find freedom or breakthrough or even healing. And I know Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Amen? I know that there's no situation that is too difficult for him. 
That I do know. But here's what we do. And, and this, is, this is a lie. We say things like this. I believe that God heals marriages. But let me tell you why it won't work for me. <laughs> My spouse, man, they, they're like level 10 all the time. And they ain't never going to come. They ain't never going to change. So I, I know God can heal marriages, but it, it, he ain't going to be able to heal mine. You know, I've got this, I've got this pain in my body, right? The lie would be, I've got, the, the, the fact is I have this pain in my body. The lie would be that I'm going to be stuck with this for the rest of my life. Yeah. And that I can never receive healing. Come on. I love that we had a lot of breakthrough last weekend. And because of the line of work I'm in, I'm thinking, your, your fight is not over. Yeah. Now, the battle has been won, but you're still going to have to suit up. You're still going to have to press through. You're still going to have to put an effort through to say and to make sure that you never end back up at that place. Yeah. Good. Like you can't just say, well, I left that. At the, I'm done with it. And then go back out and then something happens, you start struggling again, and then you're right back to that same, maybe even worse. So accountability, getting in the Word, spending time with the Lord, checking yourself before you wreck yourself. Come on. But I was thinking, this is exciting up here. But I'm thinking, whoa, there's some, you can't just stop there. So, you know, the, the Lord can heal someone of porn addiction or sexual addiction. But, man, I just, God, my dad lusted. You know, I had family members that lusted. It's just part of who I am. That's the lie. Break that off your generation. Break it off your family line. It doesn't have to be that way. Well, my, my parents never talked to me about sex. I didn't know the healthy version of sex and, what, and how to do it right. Okay, so change it. Don't let it become your excuse of why you don't teach your kids and equip your kids not to fall into the same sin and temptation. Ooh, pick up your toes. Okay. Unforgiveness. Well, <laughs> sometimes I can forgive people, but there's other times then people need help. <laughs> and I don't know if I've got enough in me to be able to forgive those people. Y'all, you realize that you cannot approach God unless you have forgiven those who have ought against you. So if there's anybody in your life that you have not forgiven or that you're bitter or resentful towards, you better ask the Lord to help you and find it in your heart to get to that person and say, will you forgive me for calling me up and embarrass me in front of all the people last week <laughs> or two weeks ago? I'm just kidding. I'm just paying them back. All right. But we shouldn't do that either. So would you forgive me, seriously? <laughs> and that's how this all works out. Whatever. All right. Here's one. I believe, uh, I believe in tithing, but let me tell you why it won't work for me. <laughs> Man, my finances have been in a shamble all this time. I grew up in the poorest of homes, so there's no way it's going to work out for me. That's the lie. So you got to shift it and say, despite how I grew up, I'm stewarding and seeing my finances differently. Just as Peke was saying this morning, it's his. And he has entrusted me to steward what he's given me. And I'm going to steward it well. I'm not going to steward it like my parents did. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it God's way and I'm going to get his results. Amen? All right, I'll spend enough time on that. In essence, what we're saying when we have that excuse, 
We're saying, I'm I'm the exception to the power of God. Well, let me tell you, you're not the exception to the power of God. There are no exceptions to the power of God. There's nowhere and nothing that the power of God can't fix and nowhere that it can't go. So don't make up excuses of why it won't work for you. It will work for you. Someone needs to say that. It will work for me. Now say it like you mean it. So John 5, 5, a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. Now we would assume that this infirmity would have been in his legs, obviously, right? Because he couldn't get up and walk. But here's the point. The word infirmity here actually means weakness or weaknesses. He had a weakness. As a matter of fact, many times this word uh, is actually translated to more than one, right? Weaknesses. All right, I just said that. So that's about that repeating thing. Hopefully you got that. Paul uses this word when he talks about God would, would not remove the thorn from his flesh. And he said, but you know what I've learned? I'm going to boast in my infirmities because when I am weak, he is strong or I am strong. And I'm talking about the power of Christ in him. So here's the question. What weakness or weaknesses do you have in your life? Let's just ponder. What weakness or weaknesses do you have in your life? Now, when you're ready to come up and tell everybody, go ahead. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. And you say, well, Matt, I don't, I, don't, I don't really know what my weakness or weaknesses are. I, I don't really, I'm, I'm not sure I have any. Well, if you're married, ask your spouse. They probably have a list of them. <laughs> and they'll give you one to, to ponder and chew on for the remaining of the service. <laughs> now, for, for this guy, he had a physical weakness. But maybe there's a physical weakness in your life. But maybe there's an emotional or mental or spiritual weakness in your life. What is your weakness? So I just want you to take a moment and just write that down. Or just store it up there because in a moment, right? Because I I don't want you to leave the same way you came in today. So in a moment, you're going to have an opportunity to release that to Jesus. So what is the weakness or weaknesses, but let's just deal with one. Some of you may pull out a a list, checking it twice. All right. Number four, Jesus's miracles points to spiritual transformation and repentance. Jesus' miracles points to spiritual transformation and repentance. Jesus' miracles like healing the paralyzed man at the pool of Bethsaida were not just acts of kindness and compassion. They were meant to reveal deeper spiritual lessons about holiness, repentance, and the and the understanding of the kingdom of God. Holiness. To be set apart, sanctified, different than the way the world looks. Different than the way the world looks. Set apart. That means when the Lord delivers you from an alcohol addiction, you don't put yourself back in the place where you struggle. Your life now looks different than it used to because he transformed your life. And so you remove yourself from that place. Now, it doesn't say that I'm better than them. Mm -mm. What it does recognize is that God has set me free. And he has set me apart for such a time as this. And there are many things in our lives that we need to learn 
to consecrate ourselves and say, I need to be set apart. I can no longer put myself in those situations, especially if it's causing you to sin. Miss the mark. That's what sin is. Anything that grieves the Father's heart or the Holy Spirit. You say, well, Matt, how do I know? You'll know. You'll know when it grieves the Father's heart. You'll know when you do something that that doesn't align with God's word. Come on, right? We're smart people in here. We know. All right. Uh, repentance. God, that's key. Repentance is, is to not only turn away from the situation, but it's to change our thinking. Refine our thinking. Get it to a different place. I was thinking this way, and that got me in trouble. I need to shift my thinking to kingdom perspective, kingdom thinking, and turn away and run away. The Bible says to flee. So you don't just skip away. You get away from it. If it is something that is hindering you, keeping you, pulling you away from the presence of God, flee from it. Yeah. All right, that's a whole other message. Peke can preach that in two weeks. Uh, many who were healed by, Jesus's, uh, by Jesus missed the deeper spiritual message, focusing only on the physical benefits like being able to walk or to see. Jesus, Jesus's warning to the healed man to stop sinning highlights that his miracles aim to inspire spiritual and moral transformation. So let's connect this to the importance of effort in our own transformation. And I had a few thoughts this morning as I was praying into, so I want to share these thoughts before I move on. Actively participating in our healing is important because it reflects our faith and it aligns us with God. It aligns us with his will. And it's a holistic approach, right? It's, it's, it's our whole being, our whole person, our, uh, what, what we would say, body, soul, and spirit. Our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. So when God shows up, it's not just to heal the physical ailment going on. Yeah. It's not just to heal the one thing that's happening, but it's to make you completely whole. Your body, your soul, and your spirit. So actively participating, putting forth effort, demonstrates our trust in God's power and his desire to heal us. Uh, part of the healing process uh, for... Yeah, okay, where was I on? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's turn to Mark chapter 5. I want to share a couple accounts. I think this is important. Mark chapter 5. All right, Mark chapter 5, verse 25, and these won't be up on the screen. I apologize. Um, Mark chapter 5, verse 25. Now a woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years had endured much under many doctors. She had spent everything she had and was not helped at all. On the contrary, she became worse. Having heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothing. For she said, if I just touch his clothes, I will be what? Made well. Instantly, her flow of blood ceased and she sensed in her body that she was healed of her affliction. And immediately Jesus, verse 30, immediately Jesus released, uh, realized that the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing against you, and yet you say, who touched me? But he was looking around to see who had done this. The woman with fear and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be healed from your affliction. She put forth effort. 
she was desperate. And she realized that the one that could heal her was right in front of her. And she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. Let's look over at uh, Luke chapter, no, just kidding, Mark chapter 10. So turn over to Mark chapter 10, verse 46. See, this is all free because this was this morning as I was praying. So this doesn't cost you anything until I get back to my regular notes. All right. A blind man healed. This is verse 46. They came to Jericho and he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a large crowd uh, Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many warned him to keep quiet. But he was crying out all the more, have mercy on me, the son of David. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man and said to him, have courage, get up, he's calling for you. He threw off his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. Then Jesus answered him, What do you want me to do for you? Rabboni, the blind man said to him, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has saved you. And immediately he could see and begin to follow Jesus on the road. Hallelujah. <laughs> These individuals put forth effort to say, I want, I'll do whatever it takes. I don't care if people are trying to shush me. I need my breakthrough. I need my healing. I need God to transform me and touch my life. I need to touch Jesus today. And that's why when we say worship like nobody's watching, worship like nobody's watching because it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. All that matters is what happens between you and Jesus today. Uh, Robert Morris tells a story. Uh, he tells a story about uh, a pastor friend of his, and uh, this pastor was telling him that this guy would come up every Sunday morning in a wheelchair, and uh, he wasn't paralyzed. He was a heavy set man. He just had a weakness, but every Sunday he would come up for prayer. And the pastor had been studying this word, and so he just asked the man. He goes, sir, I want to ask you, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be made well? And the gentleman in the wheelchair actually said to him, you know, I really don't because I, I'd had to get a job. I'd have to put some effort into it. And the pastor said to him, listen, I love you, but don't come up here for prayer anymore if you don't want to be healed, if you don't want to be made whole. You see, faith is not passive. It's not a passive belief, but an active trust that requires our participation. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> Faith is not a passive belief, but an active trust that requires our participation. Yeah. That's why many times when we're praying and we're doing altar calls, we may say as an act of faith or a prophetic act of faith, you may need to just take a step and come up here to the altar. Because religion, maybe old mindset, old patterns of thinking, maybe fear will keep you stuck in that place for 38 years and all the time Jesus asking do you want to be healed or made whole but you get stuck in this place and sometimes it just requires us to take a step in the direction of the father True faith involves a willingness to step out of our comfort zones and make necessary changes and trust God for both our physical and spiritual healing. Hebrews 11.1, now faith is confidence in what we hope for 
and assurance about what we do not see. And that's why Jesus would say to this guy in this wheelchair, do you want to be made well? Are you willing to change your thinking? Are you willing to put forth effort? And Jesus is saying the same thing to you. Are you willing to put forth the effort? Y'all, sometimes we have, there's a part for us to do. Sometimes there is, and sometimes it's immediate, and there's, right, and we just recognize that God just did something amazing in me. And then there are times we have to walk it out, and we don't understand, and that's the part where I'm telling you is don't put God in a box. Sometimes we're not going to understand. Come on, man. It's okay. Make a list of questions that you will ask him when you get up to heaven. Put it in your pocket so when you're buried, you can grab it on the way up. <laughs> I got news for you. You ain't taking it with you. It's going to be in the pocket. But you probably are going to get up there, and you're not going to care about any of the questions. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's going to be so awesome. You're just going to be like, eh. I had some questions, Lord, but, you know, they're down there in the coffin. It's all good. <laughs> or if you, like, if you like to be cremated, then, Lord, it got burned up in there. <laughs> all right. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> is it right to be cremated no i'm just kidding <laughs> oh ask pastor <laughs> put me in the box <laughs> yeah, put me in the box oh lord <laughs> all right y'all get, get serious come on now all right jesus later told the man of Bethsaida. He said, sin no more lest something worse happens to you. You know, some have taken this to mean that all sickness is directly caused by sin. But that's a misinterpretation when we consider the entirety of Scripture. While not all ailments are a result of sin, there can be cases where sin is the root cause of that weakness. So I'm not saying that it's not related to sin, but it's not that reason all the time. So, right, you kind of do all the work and say, well, is there something that you haven't repented of? Is there something in your life that you're continuing to do that maybe, maybe you don't realize it's sin? And so you get around people that help you and say, bro, that's sin, or sister, that's sin. And God wants to heal you of that. He wants to set you free from that. Okay? Um, Let's see, Jesus was warning the man not to return to his previous mindset or behaviors such as bitterness, unforgiveness, resentment, blaming others, or anger because these attitudes could lead to greater harm. And do you know that for many people, um, do you know what, what many people fall into? The sin that many of us fall into is self-pity. Some individuals don't truly want to be healed because their affliction brings them attention. Amen. <laughs> oh, Lord. Some people don't truly want to be healed because their affliction brings them attention. They love it. Ooh, keep me in the spotlight. Can I get blue one right here? No, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm, anyways, they fear losing that attention if they get better, believing the enemy's lie. Mm. This mindset can lead to a negative cycle of feeling helpless, victimized, and focusing excessively on personal problems. Self-pity. Walling around in your self-pity can hinder personal growth and resilience for you. However, healing requires effort, and Jesus said, take up your bed and walk, urging us to actively participate in our healing. Are you willing to put effort into being healed and changing your life? Are you willing to put forth effort into being healed 
and changing your life. So we've discussed this morning excuses and effort, and I'd like to close with this thought, experience. And here's what I mean by this. In the story we read about in John 5, we see a man waiting by the pool for an angel to come down. That was his religious experience. The tradition that he grew up knowing for 38 years, waiting for the angel to come down and, or if you want to remove the angel element, he was waiting for the water to be stirred. And Jesus comes along and asks him, are you willing to do something different than your experience? What you've been focused on. And that was the picture that the Lord had showed me Sunday, was that there are many people around the pool that their eyes are fixed on the past experiences. And the Lord says, I'm doing something new. And just Jesus even tells him to take up his bed and walk, even though it was the Sabbath. And when questioned by religious leaders about carrying his bed on the Sabbath, the man simply responded, the man who made me well told me to carry my bed. I don't know who he was, but he told me to rise and to pick up my bed. So I did it. The man who made me well told me to carry my bed. This response highlights an important point. While it wasn't against the law to carry his bed, it was against the law to work on the Sabbath. However, the Jews had interpreted this so strictly that even carrying his bed was considered work. That's crazy. And for the man to be healed, he had to go against his religious upbringing and step out of his comfort zone. He was expecting healing in the way God had worked in the past, in his case, through the water being stirred or an angel. And when Jesus, God in the flesh, came to him and asked him if he wanted to be made well, the man didn't even realize it was Jesus. And this brings me to the theological truth of incarnation, that God in the body of a human, Jesus was God in human form. And similarly, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is God in us. And our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit as stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So Jesus asked the man a simple question. Do you want to be made well? Instead of a straightforward yes, the man gave excuses about why he hadn't been healed. And this mirrors our own tendencies to make excuses. And if the man truly wanted to be healed, he might have positioned himself a little closer to the pool, a little closer to the water, if he really wanted to be healed. God approached the man in human form, but the man didn't recognize him. If, if he had recognized, he likely would have responded differently. If he would have known that the healer was right in front of him, he would have been like, go for it, buddy, heal me. Yes. If he would have known that the one who stood in front of him would one day die on the cross for his sins. That the one who was in front of him was God in the form of man he would have responded differently. I wonder, when leaders or fellow believers approach us offering prayer and support, if we might dismiss it, thinking things will turn out or turn around on their own. It'll all work out. 
no, I don't, I don't need you to pray for me today. Or, no, I don't need to come up here and get pray, prayer today. Everything will work out. It's, it's just part of God's plan. It'll just all work out. But what if today that offer for help is actually God working through the individuals, our prayer team, that I'm going to invite up here in just a moment. God working through them to say, do you want to be made well? Rise and take up your bed. Don't pass by opportunities, especially when there is something going on in your life that needs prayer, that needs someone just to encourage you to speak truth to love on you, to say Jesus has got this, to say Jesus sees you, he knows you, he knows everything that's going on. Don't pass up the opportunity this morning to rise, pick up your bed and be healed and made whole. Thank you for listening today. Our hope is that this message is an encouragement to you to change your world. Before you go, we want to connect with you. If you have a prayer request, you're interested in what we have to offer for our students, or you want to learn more about us, visit us at our website at lifehousefellowship.net. Remember, great days are here and greater days are ahead.